Uh, okay, so um, where are we at here? We have uh, we have our Reynolds average equation here. We've um, sort of taken care of the turbulence in this turbulent viscosity term that sits over here. Um, last time we talked about how this eddy diffusivity of momentum term uh, is typically expressed in terms of models that are related to um, inner coordinates, u plus and uh, y plus. And so uh, we talked about what those uh, meant and, and how they're defined. And today what we're going to do is actually um, <coughs> use one of these models to uh, solve not this whole equation but uh, this equation simplified for application in what's called the Coet flow region. So very near the wall <clears throat> and by that I mean uh, in the first 20 to 40 percent of the boundary layer you have a region of the flow where basically the only term that's important is this last one. And these other terms, these inertial terms, and the, the pressure gradient of the free stream uh, really aren't very important. So uh, in the quet flow region, you, you only retain this term here. So you can, you can write that this term is equal to, to zero. So if you think about what that means, you know, what's inside of these parentheses is what we've been calling the apparent shear stress. It's the sum of the... Um, the viscous shear stress, which is the molecular viscosity, and then the turbulent transport of momentum, which is this turbulent viscosity. So that's t saying that in the Coet flow region, this uh, apparent shear stress must be a constant, right? This, this d differential equation boils down to saying that the, um, the gradient of the apparent shear stress is equal to zero, which if you integrate once or if you just think about it, tells you that the apparent shear stress has to be equal to a constant. It's not changing in the coet flow region. In fact, that's what coet flow means, constant shear stress, right? So um, the coet flow region is right next to the wall, which means that that shear stress, that constant has to be equal to the shear stress at the wall, tau sub s. So <clears throat> this is our sort of differential equation, a much simpler differential equation that we have to solve in the quet flow region, right? We have uh, the shear stress at the wall is the total viscosity, right? The molecular and the turbulent viscosity uh, added together times du dy. <clears throat> Just to sort of maybe um, back up and, and think about what this means um, for a laminar flow, for a laminar flow, you still have a coet flow region, right? It's just like a turbulent flow in that sense. Um, but in a laminar flow, the, the turbulent viscosity is always zero. You don't have any turbulent eddies. That is what makes a laminar flow a laminar flow. So this, this um, term here just boils down to mu. So in a laminar flow, in the coet region, you have that the shear stress at the wall is equal to mu d uh, u bar dy. And if you think about that, well, the shear stress at the wall is a constant, and the molecular viscosity is, you know, ignoring temperature dependence or anything like that, is a constant. So du bar dy must be equal to a constant in the quet flow region of a laminar flow, right? You have a linear velocity distribution when you have a constant shear stress, <clears throat> provided you have a laminar flow. So if we come over here and look at the velocity as a function of position, and you know this was a plot that we showed when we were doing integral techniques and it shows some different approximations to the real velocity distribution in a laminar flow. The real velocity distribution in a laminar flow is this um, dashed uh, black line here and um, if you look at it there is definitely a region in a laminar flow that extends quite a long ways where the dashed black line is linear, right? You can see that it sends at least 40% of the boundary layer, and maybe a little farther, depending on how, how much you were gonna allow it to deviate from linear. So, you know, for that 40% of the boundary layer or so, you have a constant shear stress in a laminar flow. You also have a constant shear stress in a turbulent flow in that region, and that's the coet flow region. The difference is that if you have a turbulent flow, um, this, uh, 
turbulent viscosity doesn't go away, right? And this turbulent viscosity is not constant. It's, it's a function of where you're at in the flow and how active those turbulent eddies are, right? So if you solve for du bar dy in a turbulent flow, you get the constant shear stress at the wall. Here you have that constant molecular viscosity, but here you've got a turbulent viscosity that's gonna be a function of, of where you are in the flow and you know what the flow is doing. So you know, based on this equation here, you wouldn't expect that, that du dy is a constant. You wouldn't expect a linear velocity distribution anymore, even in the coet flow region. You would expect actually a velocity distribution that initially uh, has a pretty large um, velocity gradient, right, when this is small near in the viscous sublayer, and then as this turbulent uh, term gets bigger and bigger, you would expect the velocity gradient to get smaller and smaller, right, and that's basically saying it's just easier to transport momentum. All right, so <clears throat> this is the differential equation we have to solve. It's a little harder for a turbulent flow than it is for a laminar flow, but we have at our disposal all these different models for uh, for this term, for the turbulent viscosity, and they're all expressed here in terms of um, inner coordinates. So no matter which model I choose, and because I'm fairly lazy, I'm going to choose the easiest one, which is this uh, top one here. But even if I chose you know, any of them, um, I need to express my differential equation in uh, terms of inner coordinates so that I can just substitute this guy into, into that differential equation. So that's the first thing we're going to do is take this uh, differential equation and rather than expressing it in terms of dimensional velocity and dimensional position, I'm going to express it in terms of uh, this non-dimensional inner velocity right here, u plus, and non-dimensional inner position, y plus, right? So these are the substitutions that I'll make here and here. So u bar becomes what? u bar becomes u plus times u star, so u plus times u star, and uh, y becomes, I guess y becomes y plus times uh, this L characteristic, which is u star times mu divided by tau sub s. So y becomes y plus, and then u star mu divided by tau sub s, right? So this group right here, that's one over the characteristic length of the viscous sublayer. So those are the two substitutions I made. Um, the u stars cancel, the tau sub s is cancel, uh, and I'm left with this equation here. I'm going to bring this viscosity that's left inside of the parentheses, so this first term becomes 1, and the second term becomes rho over mu times the eddy diffusivity of momentum, and uh, mu over rho is just the kinematic viscosity. So this is what I'm left with when I take this dimensional um, differential equation and just turn it into a non-dimensional differential equation. And of course, the, the point of this is just that th this term right here is going to be given to me in terms of u plus and y plus. So this is a much more convenient form for this differential equation. <coughs> so um, I can take any one of those uh, models and substitute it into this differential equation to get myself a velocity distribution. And that would be uh, a law of the wall, right? The universal velocity distribution really isn't that universal in the sense that every model that you want to pick up and substitute into here is going to give you a different one. They should all look basically the same because they're all based on the same set of data. But uh, we're going to use this prandtl taylor model. So this is a two-layer model in that it, uh, it breaks the, um, the flow up into two layers. The first layer is y plus less than 11.5. So this is everything out to 11.5 times um, the distance that we think the viscous sublayer extends, right? So 11.5 times that L characteristic, right? So in that region, the turbulent viscosity is zero. And then if we go beyond that region, suddenly the turbulent viscosity turns on and apparently uh, grows as you move farther and farther away from the wall. So the rate of growth is this kappa term. And kappa uh, is a fairly famous constant called the von Karman constant, and it's equal to 0 0.41, right? So we have this very simple model where we've said we either don't have any um, turbulent eddies, right? We don't have any turbulent transport, or we have turbulent transport, and it's growing as we get farther and farther from the wall, right? So plotted, it looks like this. Here's my uh, turbulent viscosity. It's zero in this region that includes the viscous sublayer. And then 
Once we get beyond that region, it jumps up to whatever it needs to be, kappa times 11.5 minus 1, and then continues to grow as I move away. This growth is related to the fact that these turbulent fluctuations become less and less bounded by the wall as you move farther and farther into the, into the flow, right? So the, the fluctuations can get more and more violent. So this is the um, model we're going to use. Um, and literally, we're just going to take this model and substitute it into this differential equation. So for, for um, y plus less than 11.5, we're going to have um, this differential equation here, right? So I'll just take uh, epsilon sub m equals 0 and plug it into here, and I get this differential equation here. If I set, separate this and integrate it, starting at 0 for both y plus and for u plus, I get this equation, which is just that u plus equals y plus. So for small values of y plus, I get a linear velocity distribution. That should make sense, given that that's what I expected for a laminar flow. And in the viscous sublayer, I basically have the equivalent of a laminar flow. So if I go uh, beyond, let me get my pointer to work here. If I go beyond y plus equals 11.5, then, um, then I'm taking this model and substituting it into here. So that's what I've done here. Um, the one and the minus one cancel out. So, um, all right, so I get, uh, if I bring all of the, uh, if I, if I bring this to the other side, I get that du plus dy plus is 1 over kappa y plus. And then I'll just separate this. So du plus is dy plus over kappa y plus. I can integrate both sides. I have to be careful in my integration, though, because um, you know I, I'm not integrating from y plus equals 0. Um, you know, if I look back up here, the differential equation I have isn't valid at y plus equals 0. The differential equation that I have here starts being valid at y plus equals 11.5. So the lower limit of my integration here is y plus equal 11.5. Um, at that point, u plus is equal to, according to this equation right here, also 11.5. So um, this is the integral that I got to do. Um, the left side here becomes u plus minus 11.5. Uh, the right side here becomes 1 over kappa times the log of y plus over 11.5. Um, so I can do a little bit of algebra here. And this is what the velocity distribution is outside of 11.5, right? So uh, below 11.5, I have this velocity distribution. Uh, beyond 11.5, I have this velocity distribution. So it is linear for a little while, and that little while only extends to what would be the equivalent of the viscous sublayer. Once you get beyond the viscous sublayer, though, it's not linear anymore, right? Now all of a sudden you have um, you have a velocity distribution that's uh, it's very nonlinear, even though you're still in the uh, coet flow region. So let's um, just sort of summarize that. I took this Prandtl-Taylor model. Uh, I'm sorry, this Prandtl-Taylor model, and did the necessary math and came up with this version of the universal velocity distribution or the law of the wall, right? And every single one of those models uh, that was in that table that we showed before for epsilon, so back somewhere here, every one of these models for any diffusivity of momentum corresponds to its own uh, universal velocity distribution if you, if you go through and do the, and do the math. All right, so let's plot um, the one that we just did, which is this guy here. Uh, and we'll plot it on the same plot as, you know, sort of our best set of data for what's actually going on in a turbulent flow. And that's, um, that's what I'm showing here. So this is the, um, oops, I don't want that. This is the inner velocity. So this is u plus as a function of inner position, so y plus, right? And so this black line is our Prandtl-Taylor model. Uh, you can... Um, pretty clearly see the uh, discontinuity that happens at 11.5 where I switch from one model of the eddy diffusivity of momentum to another. Below 11.5 I have a linear velocity distribution. It doesn't look linear on this plot because this is a, a linear scale here but a log scale here so it looks like it's curved but in fact that's a linear uh, velocity distribution. Uh, beyond 11.5 you can see I have um, something that's actually logarithmic. 
right? So um, it looks linear. <coughs> But it's actually logarithmic because of the choice of the axis. Um, some things that we can see here that's kind of interesting. Um, one is if I compare the two-layer model, the black line, to the data, the blue line, it agrees really well down here at low values of y plus, which says that the actual data must actually exhibit a, a linear velocity distribution. Not all the way out to 11.5 the way we assume, though only out to maybe what, y plus equals four or five, right? So in terms of how large our viscous sublayer actually is, it must be about, I don't know, four or five, maybe six times um, the uh, characteristic length of the viscous sublayer that we, um, that we came up with. So basically around y plus equals six is where you would expect the viscous sublayer to sort of end. And, and, and when it ends, you see this velocity distribution going away from being linear and towards being uh, kind of nonlinear, which is, is basically saying that um, you have more than just molecular viscosity at work, right? When, when this deviation occurs is when you would expect to sort of be able to say that uh, you, know, you have some turbulent uh, viscosity, turbulent eddies that are just starting to help. The other place the data and the model agree real well is out here. So if you go beyond about um, 30 or 40, you can see that the blue line and the black line collapse again. So what you're seeing out there is that um, basically molecular viscosity is not important at all anymore. Right? You're out in a region here where you, you absolutely have uh, only turbulent uh, viscosity, turbulent eddies doing the transport for you. Right? The molecular viscosity is still there, but it's just not important at all. And not only that, it's it's showing that these uh, the, the turbulent viscosity isn't a constant. It's growing as you move farther and farther from the wall. And it's growing according to the von Karman constant, right? That's what you see there. And then this region, uh, you know, between where I have a linear velocity distribution and where I have a logarithmic velocity distribution, this is called the buffer region. And, and that's basically the region where you can't say either one of these two things are dominant, right? You have both things going on uh, at the same time. You have uh, molecular viscosity uh, and you have turbulent viscosity, and they're both um, they're both pretty important, right? Uh, one thing we said uh, some time ago when we were talking about characteristics of turbulent flow is that um, you, know, you get all of your temperature gradient across the viscous sublayer because right, that's your big resistance, and you get all of your velocity gradient across the viscous sublayer because, you know, for the same reason, that's your, that's your big resistance. And if I were to look at this um, plot on a, on a linear scale instead of a log scale, and this isn't even a linear scale that goes very far, you can see that, yeah, the velocity gradient is really concentrated in this initial region that's very near the wall, right? And then after that, um, you get out to to a much more, um, to a velocity gradient that's much uh, smaller, right? Corresponding to a, a higher viscosity. If you go beyond y plus equals 300 in either of these two things, you, you can see, you know, they stop at around 300. And that's because when you go beyond 300, you're into, um, what's called the wake region. You're out of the couette region. You're into a region where the couette's approximation doesn't really hold anymore. And some other details of the flow become pretty important. And so you might get different uh, behavior depending on the pressure gradient or things like that. And so um, the velocity distribution is no longer universal in the sense that it depends on uh, other characteristics of the flow. If you're inside of the couette flow region, the reason this is called a universal velocity distribution is that it, it doesn't really depend very much on the pressure gradient or some of these other uh, details of the flow.